Um, today's speaker is uh, Dr. Ashley Dare. She'll be speaking about social science insights on landowners, wildlife habitat conservation behavior. Ashley, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and start. Great, I thought I'd turn on my video briefly to say hello, and then I understand it's challenging for some folks with bandwidth issues, so I'll turn it off. Um, great to be able to be here today and share my thoughts um, as a social scientist about landowners' wildlife habitat conservation behavior. I had the opportunity to work with your JV back in January when international travel was, was still allowed. And so I, I have a little bit of an idea of what you all have been thinking about and struggling with related to engaging private landowners uh, on their land in, in conservation activities. Um, but of course, my perspectives today will be heavily um, influenced by my work that's based primarily in the US. So I hope it can still be valuable to you all. And with that, I'll turn off my camera and get rolling. All right, so let's start by thinking about what do people have to do with habitat? And I always like to, to start in this place because I work in a wildlife department and I frequently uh, work with folks in bird conservation and wildlife conservation. And typically what they're all excited about talking about is the habitat itself, the animals that live there, the processes going on there ecologically, and they usually aren't so focused on thinking about the people there. Now, I find that joint ventures are a little bit different in this case. Quite often, the folks in joint ventures, because they work on the ground and because they're interacting with people to make conservation happen, have a bit of a different uh, take on that. But still, I think we often think about people's connection to habitat as the destruction and loss of habitat. Whether or not that be that we think about the energy development that may be occurring or ex-urban housing development or pollution of water or forest fragmentation or beach stabilization, conservation scientists and environmentalists alike are all very skilled at identifying the negative impacts that people have on the environment and on habitat. I like to keep in mind that when we're talking about habitat creation, restoration, protection, conservation, that's also the work of people. So there's many ways that we can think about this. Uh, one that often comes to people's mind when you talk about environmental conservation behavior is the planting of trees, a youth group, a school group. And they um, typically have these sort of projects to help instill the ideas and values of habitat um, uh, conservation within children. Or we could be talking about things like working with landowners to conduct prescribed burns to stimulate native grasslands, or working uh, with landowners who may be able to be creating wetland habitat on their property or encouraging another group of landowners to follow best management practices within the forest management on their land for species like the golden winged warbler. Or working with landowners to use new methods to eliminate or decrease invasive species on their property. Or we may be thinking about trying to work with landowners to help encourage them to put their land under conservation easement voluntarily. And then in my neck of the woods, landowners and citizens alike also get involved through advocacy in helping ensure the protection and restoration of habitat. This is a, a pipeline um, that's been proposed and trying to get through for an extensive period of time, and there's a very large advocacy movement around it. So again, in all of these cases, it's a group of people taking action for habitat. And those groups of people include volunteers, school groups, private landowners, public land managers, farmers, family forest owners, land trusts, citizen activists. And, and so there's really a whole array of ways that we need and rely on people being involved in habitat management and conservation activities in order for us to be successful in the work that we do for uh, bird and wildlife conservation. So then of course, the question of what do people have to do with habitat? They are the people who take action, hopefully action that's in the direction of the protection or creation of habitat as opposed to the destruction side of, of um, habitat uh, actions. 
And so we're talking about ranchers, agricultural producers, forest landowners in the area that I live in. So I understand from doing a little uh, background information, hopefully um, this is a agreed upon stat here that you all really do have quite a large percentage of private land within the PPR region of the Prairie Habitat Joint Venture. And so like in many places of, in the US, when you're talking about working on habitat conservation activities, it's very closely tied to having to work with private landowners. So while we often think of those who manage habitat as the people who work for federal government, um, for state government, local government, ex provincial government, et cetera, uh, in the case of many of the places where we work um, on our conservation activities, the people who, who need to be involved in habitat management and habitat conservation are actually more of the faces on the bottom of the screen here. Individuals and family landowners, and in some cases also corporate landowners and industrial landowners, which I won't be talking about as much today, but I recognize plays a large role um, in, in the PHJV as well. And then all of the decisions that they make are within the context of laws, policy, institutions, constraints, and many other facilitators as well. So when I think about the approach that we need to take for effective habitat management and wildlife conservation, regardless of where you're working, it's important that we apply the best available science to that habitat management and wildlife conservation. This is a premise within conservation that's very well accepted. Um, that's what drives many of us to do our work is to have that science available to then be able to inform conservation. Some of you are involved in creating that science, some of you are involved in applying that science, some of you are involved with working with others to try to encourage them to apply that science. I think the part that we often miss though is just applying the best available biological science isn't going to be effective enough uh, for what we need to be doing for conservation. We need to be thinking about applying the best available social and biological science. I think a lot about the research to implementation gap in conservation and it drives a lot of what I do and what keeps me going each day. Because I'm really interested ultimately in all the work I do as a scientist being useful on the ground and being utilized for conservation. Yet it's pretty well known that we have a gap between the research we're doing and whether or not it's implemented. It's been referred to as knowing but not doing. It's been referred to as science failing to inform conservation. And I think part of the challenge that we're facing within the research um, to implementation gap, and it's not just me actually who says this, is that we are not effective enough in bringing together all the parties that need to be together to ensure that research really is going to be useful and usable and, and focused on the right thing. And that includes involving social scientists and biological scientists and also involves thinking about the decision makers and ensuring that you're engaging the folks who are going to be involved in delivering and implementing conservation throughout the whole entire process of the science that you're doing as well. This takes us to things such as transdisciplinary science as it's also often referred to or co-production of science. I'm not gonna talk about that heavily today, but you'll notice in several of my examples that I do talk to talk about and allude to the, the various partner organizations that are heavily involved in our research projects and then utilizing the results now that we are not as involved in doing the research phase. So let's talk a little bit about the, the social science side of things though. So I know you all have already had an intro to human dimensions, so you probably don't need to see this, um, but social science is the, the study of human society or human behavior and society. And when we talk about conservation social science, we're talking about applying that to conservation. A great paper by Nathan Bennett et al. that I hope um, many of you have read, and if you haven't read, you definitely should read, that, that defines the field of conservation and social science. And it refers to the subset of classic and applied social science disciplines that focus on conservation or environmental management issues. So when they refer to classic disciplines, they're talking about things such as psychology or environmental psychology, anthropology, philosophy, geography, all of those various ologies on, on the human side. And then when they talk about the applied 
uh, um, conservation and social sciences, they're talking more about fields that already are very focused on applications. So conservation education or conservation law or human dimensions of conservation. And then there's also, of course, interdisciplinary conservation social science, such as human ecology or social ecological system science. And the value, of course, of having social sciences at the table is, as I laid out in the beginning, we're focused on people in many cases and how to encourage them to be involved in promoting habitat conservation at, or discourage them from doing the things that are destructive to habitat. And the social sciences have the analytical tools and have established knowledge and theory that can really help explain and predict those patterns of human behavior, which then is really vital to our success if we want to be science-driven and effective in how we're, we're moving forward with conservation. So what I'm gonna do here today is share with you all insights from four or on four major topics related to private lands, conservation, and social science that I think can be valuable in thinking about uh, any sort of uh, issue or question related to private lands conservation. So the first one is what makes a landowner decide to do whatever it is that you're hoping that they'll do? What makes them decide to conduct prescribed burns? What makes them decide to follow best management practices? What makes them decide to put their land in a conservation easement? And this is the focus of a lot of the social science in this realm. So if you're interested in a specific type of action or behavior, and you do a literature search in Google Scholar, you're often likely to find something similar or maybe even the, the specific behavior you're interested in, depending on um, how well studied that behavior has been. I think what's more interesting is there have been some meta-analyses um, in the past, and then again, there's been one that's even more recent in 2019 that I'll show you the citation for in a moment. And these uh, meta-analyses have looked at all of the private lands literature and tried to characterize what are the factors that we see being used in these social science studies to understand landowner management activities. And so we, we organize them here based on these two papers into four main categories. The first is the land characteristics. So of course, that's to some degree, the environmental component drives what it is the landowner does the land quality and land acreage, the species present on the site, et cetera. And then of course, there's a variety of characteristics of the landowner. What are their demographics, their age, their education, whether or not they live on the land or their absentee? Uh, what is their financial capacity? Do they have past experience in doing whatever it is that you're interested in them doing on their land? Do they have access to information, et cetera? Then there's also the psychological characteristics of, of that landowner, their attitudes, their beliefs, their norms, their motivations. So what it is that they think themselves, what it is that they think other people think they should be doing, and then what's driving them to do those behaviors. And then finally, there's the characteristics of what it is that you're hoping someone will do as well, and whether that be just a practice or actually getting them engaged in a specific program. So thinking about the cost to benefit ratio um, within that practice, if the landowner goes through that thought process, with, which is not always the case, um, the practice complexity, the aesthetics that might result from it, et cetera. So all these things come into play and then many more that follow under each of these categories, as well as, like I said, sort of more institutional structures um, and, and uh, external factors that might be acting on the environment um, or, or the, the policy situation in which someone is, is acting. Now, the, the part that's a little bit tricky here is when you look at these actual variables and whether or not they consistently predictive and whether or not those relationships are positive relationships, as in as one variable increases, then as so does the likelihood of behavior or whether they're negative relationships is unfortunately very variable. People are very hard to predict. And as I said before, there's many contextual factors or factors about the behavior itself that play a role. So a recent paper by Linda Procopy and her colleagues looked at about 93 uh, quantitative studies um, related to the adoption of conservation practices by farmers specifically. And this was 35 years of social science research 
And this includes everything from nutrient management to livestock management, pest, water, conservation programs as well. Habitat management specifically was only 1% of the studies that they were looking at. But they were all had an environmental um, connection, of course. So they found on the right-hand side that there were 20 variables out of a very long list, um, over 50 variables that they were looking at that had a consistently positive relationships. So things like whether or not someone has a past experience that's positive with doing the behavior, that's a good indication that they're gonna keep doing the behavior. Whether or not they have awareness of programs and practices being available to them, whether or not they have positive environmental attitudes. None of these things are a big surprise. Um, then on the side of the mixed or neutral relationships, they found that it really depends whether or not age is going to be a driver, uh, depends on, on which activity or which type of conservation behavior we're looking at, likewise for gender. And there were 28 other variables that that's the case for. And then consistently negative relationships, they actually said that there's just not many studies that are looking at things that are negative relationships besides what you might expect. Like if someone does not have an environmental attitude, then of course that's a negative predictor. But a lot of the focus is on what, what's a positive um, relationship as opposed to the negative relationship. And what the research really highlighted, besides the fact that there's 20 variables that are consistently useful for us to look at, is that it depends. It depends on the type of behavior we're looking at, the type of landowners, the context, et cetera. And so they really point out that moving beyond our understanding of these 20 key variables that are useful for understanding positive relationships, we need to keep understanding beyond just the psychological components or the individual level components. What is it that we can look at in terms of characteristics of the behavior or characteristics of the context that the landowner is operating in so that we can grow our understanding in this area? So I point this all out to say this is an excellent paper to look at so that you can be aware of the variables that do have consistently positive relationships. But otherwise, it is useful often to be looking specifically at the literature for your area that you're doing work in. So if someone has done social science in that area, great. If someone hasn't, then you really need to think carefully as you look at other studies about the same behavior and make sure you think that you'd have the same results within your area, or even better, actually do a study within your area. All right. So the second piece that I want to talk about is that there's different types of landowners with different needs. So I was trying to come up with, you know, what is it that's going to predict whether or not a landowner um, keeps their, their land or, or keeps their um, uh, land in a conservation easement over a considerable period of time. It's going to be hard to find just one set of predictors because you have different landowners. You may have landowners who are very environmentally minded. You may have landowners who are very production driven, et cetera. That's often what we think about. And there's, there's an array of typologies that have been created for understanding landowners in this way. Um, and really, it just boils down to trying to figure out what's the best way to lump or split landowners into different groups so that we can understand some of this diversity of thought or diversity of behavior that we see. So I did some work in this area when I was doing my dissertation research um, in, in uh, southern uh, tier of New York related to early successional habitat conservation, specifically people creating um, patch or clear cuts for habitat for things like golden leaf warbler and woodcock. And we were able to create a typology based upon people's behavioral experience in cutting patches of the forest. And so here you can see that we have four main types of landowners after uh, looking at various responses to different survey questions. And we found that the non-adopter type of landowner, one who had no past experience or no future intention in cutting the patch cut was a large characteristic of the landowners in the Southern tier. They're not interested in that, that sort of harvest um, for a variety of reasons that I won't get into here today. But that was, you know, almost half of the landowners, 40% of the landowners. Maybe some that you could actually change the minds of, but it seems more useful to focus on supporting and working with those potential adopters, the next category. So those are people who have no experience, but they have an intention to cut in the future. But we know through social science research that intentions don't always lead to action. There's many things that stand in the way of moving someone from their intention to actually taking action. 
So conservation organizations can focus on working with the landowners who have the intentions to ensure that they actually act on the intentions. That seems like a useful place to focus energy. Likewise, the past adopters who have had did the work in the past but have no intention of doing it in the future, a group of people who didn't like their experience possibly, only 5% in the case of early successional habitat um, research where the type of behavior that we were looking at seems like a group of people, it's good to just let it go. And then the continuing doctors, a, a great group of people to keep working with that have past experience as well as future intentions to patch cut, 28% of landowners. So we were interested in, can you provide the same things to these various types of landowners to have different relationships and intense relationships with the behavior as well as intentions related to the behavior. And we found that as you work with this group of landowners, that the continuing adopters or what you might call the choir that you might want to be cultivating that's into this activity and likely to do it, that this group actually needed something a little bit different. Whereas the folks who are potential adopters just said, we need more education about this. We need more technical assistance about this. The folks who are continuing adopters and had that past experience, we also need financial incentives. We need some financial support in order to be able to make this happen. And we suspect that the reason for this is because once people have gotten involved in early successional habitat management, they realize it's not an easy thing to do. They realize that there's often not adequate timber markets um, in, the, in the area where we were working, maybe in other cases, um, in order for them to actually break even on doing early successional habitat management, or they might realize that it just takes a lot of work um, in order to be cutting back uh, the trees in that area within the right matrix and over the correct intervals and at the scale they need to be doing it. And I say all this to, to point out that I think it's useful for us to think about that not every group of people is just going to need the money from the beginning. The potential adopters, that's not what they were looking for. They were looking for, for more training, knowledge, and technical support um, from agencies and organizations. But then it may be when you get to the, the point of folks who have that experience that the financial component does come into play. Not only is it useful to understand these typologies for thinking about where to focus your energy, it also can be useful for thinking on what actual um, programs or tools to be offering to different groups of people. Finally, I want to talk about the phases of adoption of um, conservation behavior. So this is a schematic that we published in the paper in Conservation Letters where we think about how there's an agricultural producer who adopts a conservation activity with some sort of financial incentive in the US that's largely coming from the Farm Bill conservation funding. Then the landowner may decide whether or not to continue to enroll in that uh, conservation incentive program and if, if they have the opportunity to, in which case they'd be considered someone who's retained, and if not, they'd be considered someone who's dropped out. And then in many cases with our, our uh, conservation incentive programs, the incentive payments stop. They might stop because the funding's run out. They might stop because there's a cap on the number of times that you can re-enroll. They might stop because there's a new priority for how those funds are allocated that a landowner is no longer competitive for getting those um, funds in the future. And so we were really interested in what happens in the case that you stop paying someone the literature predicts in some cases that if you pay someone to do something, you've basically encouraged them to think that any sort of motivations that they had in the past to just do it because it's the right thing have stopped. And so then they need money into the future. But then there's others who say that over the course of someone being involved in doing that conservation activity, maybe they've cultivated more of a stewardship mindset or seen the values of it. So maybe they'll continue to do that activity. And of course, it's always, this is very useful to be thinking about in terms of the durability of our conservation investments. So whether or not when we put money into working with farmers or landowners, just for the time period that we're paying them that we actually see the habitat on the ground, or is it something that's going to last into the future? So we looked at how many studies actually did work in this realm and it was really quite small. Uh, but based upon the studies that we did find, based upon some of the uh, literature on more of the adoption phase, 
as well as some literature out of um, energy conservation behaviors, you know, whether or not people turn out their lights when they leave the room. We were able to look at this concept of persistence and what might be predicting it. So we, we um, laid out that we think that it would be based upon people's thoughts, again, the landowner cognitions, whether or not they have motivations to keep doing it in the future. And then also some aspects of behavioral inertia, whether or not someone's formed a habit uh, that they want to continue doing that habit because it just becomes second nature, or whether the, the behavior itself is one that's easier just to continue doing then whether or not they have the resources as well as their social influences. So it's the framework that we lay out in this paper. And then we went on to some other research in, back in the, the young forest realm, as well as in the Great Plains that I'll talk about in a moment, where we tried to apply this framework to understand whether or not landowners um, continue to this, their behavior that they're involved in. So in the case of the early successional habitat work, this is a different study. We were looking at landowners in Appalachia, as well as landowners in the Great Lakes region of the U.S., and we were interested in whether their involvement in these programs and their interest in, in creating patches of early successional forest habitat continued after their involvement in two different types of Farm Bill-funded programming ended. And for this study, we only were able to look at three, three of the sets of variables. We looked at cognitions, motivations, and resources. And we compared whether or not people were persisting or intended to persist with the behavior with whether or not they uh, had continued enrollment in the program. And we actually found that when it came to continued enrollment, so that middle phase in my diagram, cognitions and motivations were what were most predictive. So if you had thoughts that what you had done on your land was a valuable thing, if you thought that it was working out, if you had a positive attitude towards it, then you were likely to continue enrollment. And if you had motivations that were tied to wanting to have wildlife on your land, wanting to have habitat, et cetera, then you continued enrollment as well. But when it came to persistence and whether or not you were continuing this sort of activity after your funding ended, the cognitions didn't matter as much and the resources matter. So this is similar to what I showed you from the previous study. The landowners who actually had resources from off-farm income or weren't relying on their forest for their income were the landowners who were more likely to persist with the habitat conservation behavior. And then of course, motivation still played a role. So again, I think it's really showing that it's important for us to think about this persistence phase as well, if that's part of our goal is to see long-term habitat on the ground. And we can't just assume because we've done some work with landowners with conservation incentives in the short term, that that's going to be a long-term solution. All right, so we then went on and applied this framework in a study with the Conservation Reserve Program in the Great Plains um, of the U.S. We worked in five states right there in the center of my map. And in those states, the color in yellow is very prevalent. And that's showing that in this area, a lot of landowners were predicted to be coming out of enrollment in the Conservation Reserve Program, as well as already had come out of enrollment in the program. So we were interested in what were these landowners doing on their land now that they no longer were getting paid to have their land in retirement. Um, were they turning it back over to crops or were they getting involved in a new conservation program or were they just keeping it in grass? And we, we found, um, first, first I should say, as we looked at landowners who had left the program, uh, their, their contracts had already ended as well as landowners who were still in the program. So if we start on the left-hand side of my screen, these are people whose fields had expired in CRP, no longer getting CRP funding, that funding to put your land in retirement. We found that actually 62% of the landowners had kept their land in grass. So some level of persistence is going on, um, more than half of the land. So that's great. Still, you know, this results in, in many, 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 many acres. Um, being out of, of grass um, once the payment ends. And only 28% actually reverted to crops. 5% actually did enroll in another conservation program. So maybe we could add that in and say about two thirds of the land still had some level of, of the benefits from the original payments. And then 5% of the land was sold and the landowners weren't um, able to tell us what had happened to it. 
Then if we look at the land uh, into the future, we see that the intention is to keep the land and grass is only 55%, so a little bit less than what the, the landowners actually did. The conversion to crops, um, the intentions there is, are even higher than what we actually saw happening. But what's most interesting here is that 40% of landowners say they'd be interested in enrolling in another program. You may be noticing here that this is not up to 100%. That's because we allowed landowners to answer more than one thing um, for what they thought a majority of the land um, that was currently enrolled would, would roll over into. So this really stands out to me, that enrollment in another program. 40% say they'd be interested in it. Only 5%, if you look on the left-hand side, actually enrolled in another conservation program. So there's a gap here. Either the conservation programs aren't available, which isn't actually the case. There are conservation programs that you can roll over into out of the conservation reserve program, or it may be that landowners don't know how to get involved, or there's some other barrier to them actually getting involved in those other conservation programs. Also of interest, we look at the year for those past um, lands and what has gone on in those past um, contracts that have expired. We find that the more years since the expiration of the contract, there is less land still in grass. So basically, this is telling us that as a landowner comes out of the conservation reserve program, you have a few years window possibly to get them involved in um, another conservation program or otherwise encourage them to keep their land in grass. But over time, this may become uh, less likely. Now, there could also be things like hop, crop prices, et cetera, playing a role here. We don't know for sure that all of this is necessarily just um, some sort of behavioral lag. Then in terms of predictors, we have a large model, lots of tables. I'm not going to show you that. If you're interested, um, I can, can share a, a list of resources after my talk, and it has a link to a report that we've written that's uh, available online. And we have one journal article out of this and another one that we're, we're working on. But, but basically, whether or not a landowner is going to continue to have their land and grass after they come out of the conservation reserve program is tied with whether or not they had positive experiences with the program, whether or not they trust the conservation personnel that are involved with the program, whether they have environmental attitudes that are positive about the conservation behavior um, and environmental attitudes even tied to agriculture, I should say whether they have motivations to improve forage quality for their livestock, motivations to increase grazing land. So in many cases, landowners were doing sustainable grazing as they came out of the conservation reserve program. The motivations to improve wildlife habitat, often this is tied to huntable species. Perceived ease of keeping the field as is, so this is that behavioral inertia or the habits part playing out and the desire to keep their field as is. And then the social influence component also playing a role, neighbors who are keeping their field and grass afterwards. Interestingly, if you look at the landowners who uh, already actually did expire, there's a little bit of a difference. Again, actual available resources comes into play. While landowners don't bring that up as much as they think about the future, when it actually, the future hits, whether or not they had cattle to ranch on the land, whether or not they had fences, whether or not they had the equipment to be doing crop production, whether or not they had water for their cattle played a role. And then also whether or not they were motivated to prevent soil erosion. This area was an area that was heavily hit by the Dust Bowl. And even though that was a considerable amount of time ago, it's still a, a large part of the culture there and a heavy concern that weighs on people's minds. And then landowners who reverted their expired field to crops had more of a business-oriented attitude about agriculture. Really, it, in many cases, it was their livelihood and their business, and they had more of a motivation to maximize profit from what they did on their land. All right, so then I want to talk about the, the last piece here. So that's a little bit of an insight into persistence and why it's important to think about it and, um, and why, why we see that it's a little bit different than just looking at someone's adoption of the behavior. Finally, I want to talk about an, an area of work that we've been doing at doing recently where we, we've been thinking about what's the role of the biologist who goes out on private lands and is studying the, the resources on that land, whether it be wildlife or the habitat um, on that land. 
And these might be biologists who are doing monitoring for one of these conservation programs, or it might be biologists with an academic institution just doing research in the area where they've asked private landowners for permission to go onto their properties. And we started first with doing this work back with the studies uh, area that I showed you all in the Appalachians and Great Lakes. There was a conservation effects assessment project, which is our natural, natural, conservation, natural resources conservation services monitoring program where they fund cooperators to go out and look at the effectiveness of the farm bill related programs that they manage. And in this case, the, the biologists were going out to the property, studying the bird species there, the habitat there, and then they would send a report back to these landowners at the end of each year, telling them about what they found on their property, what were the bird species there, and then they'd also try to encourage them to stay involved in doing this sort of habitat conservation uh, messaging, either around the success that they'd gotten or that, of course, you might need a little bit more time to actually see the results. We applied this in a quasi-experimental approach, looking at the effects of the mailing on landowners. And we had a, a relatively small sample and we found no quantitative effects detected in terms of whether or not it mattered that someone had received the mailing. But interestingly, as we qualitatively, uh, through um, interviews via the phone, talked with landowners about these reports without pushing them in any direction, of course, we found that they would talk a lot about how they gained knowledge about the birds on the property, that there was value for them socially to have these reports, they'd share them with their family and their neighbors, that it had changed their perceptions of how the management was working on their land. And then in many cases, they described it as being motivational and encouraging them to look for birds or keep trying to manage um, for young forests. So uh, sort of mixed results here, depending on which method you use for whether or not the mailing itself mattered. But actually the thing that seemed to matter the most was the landowners who had offered or asked to go out on the properties with the technicians when the technicians were on the land were impacted by that experience, it seems, um, based on our, our analyses. We found that the landowners who had done that actually had higher trust in the agency, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, even though these biologists did not actually work for the NRCS, they still just equated them with, with the, all with the same group of people. And they had better perceptions of the management. It didn't actually lead to significant differences for intentions to re-enroll or intentions to manage if the cost share was not available though. So again, we see some role um, of this interaction. So we're continuing to explore the idea of, of what do these interactions between biologists and landowners lead to in terms of conservation attitudes, interest in conservation behaviors, as well as trust in science. So we're doing work right now in southwestern Virginia. Uh, we looked at first the predictors of landowners who allow access for private lands researchers in the area. Interestingly, there's very little research on this. There's a lot of research on what predicts um, landowners' willingness to let hunters onto their land to hunt, but not whether or not they allow uh, researchers onto their land to do science. So um, we've, we've looked at that, um, and then we also now are studying the experience of these landowners as they work, um, or they allow the work of biologists onto their land to study hellbenders in nest boxes within their creek. Unfortunately, the, the interactions have been um, unfortunately shut down recently due to COVID, and we're, we're trying to still do some of that remotely by sending them pictures, et cetera. We're still able to work on their land, though. So. And then we've also been trying to think about a, a framework for bringing together the research in this realm and then continuing to do more work in the area. I'm working with um, a colleague who's a conservation biologist at Smithsonian Institute, as well as one of my graduate students. And we've been thinking about how can we explore this comprehensively in the study system that uh, our colleague works in northwestern Virginia with ranchers and ranchers who interact heavily with scientists as well as citizen scientists, looking at what encourages them to get access to their land, how those relationships are cultivated, what sort of impacts does that have on the private landowner, but also what sort of impacts does that have on the scientists. 
whether it's the citizen scientists and then their own interest in conservation or the professional scientists and how they think about what their research questions should be or how they think about the implications of their research. So all this to say, uh, for those of you who work on the ground with landowners, um, to your potential study subjects for me, uh, but also um, joking aside, I, I think that there really can be a role um, of the interaction between a biologist and the landowner on the ground. And for those of you who do take the time to have those interactions on the ground, I'm sure you have many anecdotal stories of the impact um, of, uh, that you've seen from those interactions. So we're, we're hoping to be able to document that more. So in review, what I shared with you all here today is that landowner decisions are driven by a variety of factors and really varies by the study, so important to think about that. There's different types of landowners that have different needs, so it's critical to be thinking about how you're supporting different types of landowners. But there's a need to be thinking about the persistence of landowner behavior beyond the time that you actually have them enrolled in a conservation activity, and that it's also that there could be an important role of biologists interacting with landowners. And I, I hope with all of these insights and certainly um, very committed to it in my own work, that it really is leading to changes in how conservation practices and programs are, are both ruled out and adapted and implemented. So we've been working heavily with folks um, within Natural Resource Conservation Service and also the Farm Services Agency that actually administers the, the CRP um, that I was talking about previously. To, uh, to really help them think through what it might um, influence in terms of, of their program at programming. Also been very involved in science communications. I did not um, write this headline, but it certainly led to a lot of hits for this article. Um, we worked with a great news source called The Conversation that helps academics uh, write articles that then get picked up quite often. So this was read 9,000 times. Um, and, and shared over a thousand times um, via social media. Um, and, and then I, I really do think that there's a lot of opportunity for social science to play a larger role in the work that we're doing related to monitoring and also designing conservation programs. And I really do hope that the programs within the US that have this sort of funding um, continue to increase uh, their focus on social science. I'm not as familiar with your, your mechanisms that you have in Canada, but I, I hope there's also a conversation going on there in terms of how you can bring social science to the table more to really improve the effectiveness of your conservation work. And then ultimately, what I really think that we need in order for us to have effective private lands conservation is social scientists working closely with conservation professionals and decision makers so that not only our, does our research help inform their work, but also that our research is informed by their insights on the ground because they spend even more time on the ground working with and talking to landowners than we do. And finally, I'd like to thank my team of, of staff and students uh, who were involved in the studies that I shared with you here today, as well as my colleagues um, who've been co-authors and collaborators and co-investigators on the projects that I, I shared with you all from a, variety of organizational affiliations as well. So with that, I'm happy to take questions, also happy to chat with anyone um, further but via phone or, or email. Um, you can reach me at uh, dare at vt.edu as well as find me on Twitter. All right, I am open to questions. I don't have the chat pod up, so Ian, I'll rely on you to help me out there. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, please feel free to put any questions you have in the uh, in the chat box. Or raise your hand. 
uh, one of a uh, question just came through uh, requesting a list of resources uh, that you have. Um, yeah, I, I would be if happy you to could, send out. Oh, sorry, go ahead. If you could just uh, send that to um, John, and then he can just send it out to the entire group. That would probably be the easiest way to do it. Yeah, sounds good. I'll do so. I, I have a list of all the papers that I cited here today, and hopefully that would provide a, a starting point for you all. Great. Thank you. Uh, John just replying that he'll send them that he'll send them out to the group when you uh, send them to him. All right. Um, in your review of meta analyses, how consistent are the variables across various types of conservation behavior? Yeah. So uh, the wildlife, soil. Sorry, go, ahead. go ahead. Yeah. So, so in the the paper um, by Linda Procopi and colleagues that I I mentioned, there were twenty out of I don't know if it was sixty or or eighty variables that were consistent regardless of, of what sort of behavior that you were talking about. Um, the, the others, the 30 others that there was a mix on, and then there were even others that didn't even fall in that category, um, could be driven by the type of behavior to some degree. They're currently working on more analyses with their very large data set in order to help uh, hopefully be able to try to figure out to what degree is it the conservation practice as opposed to possibly other contextual variables. The problem is they don't have a lot of contextual variables to deal with other than like what's the research site that someone was doing their work in. Um, they don't necessarily have easily in their data set, you know, what, uh, what were the crop choices in the area, et cetera. Um, unless someone was specifically looking at that. So, so it's a great question. I know that, that they are planning on, on looking at it before, looking at it more and um, could, could largely be playing a role. For example, in the work that, that I've done, I mean, even within habitat management context, you can see a difference in, in what behavior or what variables will play a role. So when you look at something like early successional habitat creation where someone has to go out and, and cut um, a bunch of trees on their property, environmental attitudes are actually, in some cases, not as strongly predictive because sometimes your environmental attitudes and the environmental um, training and background that you've been given has taught you that cutting trees is bad. Um, you know, that's certainly been a, a large part of messaging for a long time, um, at least in the US, of don't cut down trees, don't cut down the big trees. It's bad for the environment. Um, and so the landowners don't necessarily, in some cases, realize that no, it actually can be good for the environment and good for wildlife. Whereas there's other conservation behaviors like planting a tree that may be much more closely tied to an environmental attitude because it's something people have heard about a lot more as something that's good for the environment. So that's just an example of how you can even see within habitat management, how the specific behavior that you're talking about might have different predictors for it, depending on the characteristics of that behavior. Um, okay, I, they just said thank you for your uh, explanation. Um, yes, so, uh, okay, here we go. Uh, in your experience, is it more effective to engage with landowners in person or can remote communication such as phone or, ma or mail be effective in building conservation behavior as well? Yeah, so, so based upon the study that we did, it seems that that mailing itself was, was not as effective as those in-person interactions. And I would certainly say that there's other literature that supports that, you know, to, to get landowners involved in conservation, you often need to build trust. And oftentimes the building of that trust occurs over an extended period of time of getting to know 
those landowners. Now, it may be that those landowners don't want their first interaction with you to be you knocking on their door. It may be that they prefer that the inter first interaction be a phone call or be a letter. But I do think that ultimately, in order to really have an effect um, in terms of changing conservation behavior or, or cultivating their trust in an agency or organization, that investment in face-to-face -face interactions is, is really critical. I guess just maybe one other thing that I'll add to that before we wrap up here, unless someone else has a question, is we, we found, I didn't share the results with you, but through the interviews and, and surveys that my grad student has recently been doing in Southwest Virginia, that not only does um, uh, whether or not a landowner has a positive interaction with you matter for your own project, it also matters into the future. And all the other conservationists and scientists asking to get access to their land. And while that might seem quite obvious after I say it, I think it often gets forgotten. And we certainly, I think, forget it within um, our wildlife department, et cetera, uh, at the university, that what our grad student does on one day and one short study could influence the ability for us to work with those landowners for you know, decades to come. Um, landowners don't necessarily think of different scientists or different conservation professionals as different um, individuals. They instead think of it as that's the conservation people. And so if they have a negative interaction with someone that can really have lasting negative impacts, but it also instead, if it was a positive interaction could have lasting positive inter effects as well. So that's the, the other thing that I've been trying to get across as a take home. Um, from this work is it, just that investment in working with and cultivating relationships with landowners can have um, a net gain uh, for, for anyone trying to work with those landowners on conservation actions into the future. Okay, uh, great. Uh, thank you, Ashley, for your great presentation today. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining uh, today's webinar, and uh, we hope you join join us for uh, next month's webinar. And uh, I wish everybody a great day, and uh, we'll we'll see you all next month. If you do have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, send them to e or either to Ashley directly, or you can send them to John, and he'll get them to her, and, and we'll get them answered as soon as you can. Great. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. All right, thanks for having me, bye-bye.